Sometimes you just want to kick back and play an early 2000s sim game about dinosaurs with a great soundtrack and mixed or average reviews. Of course, no one actually sells the game, so off to the abandoned where sites we go. But the comments are filled with claims that it requires the CD, as well as this is Onlu the demo, blodding hell. Now the download does contain a crack folder, however this would be a short video if we just use that, so let's see if we can figure this out for ourselves instead. I don't trust the installer any more than I trust the crack, so let's get this into a VM. As an aside, I wanted to try VMware Workstation as it's now free, but what is this site it roots me to? Okay, so I've actually had to use a guide to figure out where on the website the download actually is. Anyway, I've installed the game and sure enough, it does complain about a lack of CD. The readme does have a contact number. Wonder if they can help. I've opened it up in Ghidra, an open source decompiler and disassembler, but the string isn't actually in there anywhere. This suggests that it's probably obfuscated, i.e. it's sitting in the binary in an encoded format, and then at runtime the game deobfuscates it so to get the original string out, effectively trying to prevent me doing exactly what I'm trying to do. We know that the game shows a message box, and Windows has a function called message box A, which will display a message box. So let's fire this up under a debugger. I'm using x64 debug, and set a breakpoint on that, which will allow us to pause the program when it displays this error, and have a poke around its internals. Weirdly, it's not being hit, and the message box isn't showing, but digging around, I can see I'm in command line text 02.dll. Don't know what happened to command line text 01.dll. Anyway, let's crack that open in Ghidra. Oh, it's not in the game files. So this means the DLL is probably embedded in the main game and at runtime unpacked and loaded. So let's set a breakpoint on load library, the Win32 function for loading DLLs, and yeah, we can see here that it's been loaded from the temp directory. I'm not really getting anywhere here. There must be some anti-debugging techniques going on because the game will just not run when launched from a debugger. We're actually a bit lucky here, the message box has a retry button which presumably runs whatever CD checks again as it displays the error box again when you click it. This allows us to attach a debugger to the process as it's running and then re-trigger the checks, effectively bypassing any of the initial anti-debugging techniques. Stopping on message box A and walking up the stack we end up here. This loads both versions of message box, does some checks and either calls the A version or does a text conversion and calls the W version. Without getting into the weeds of it, Windows supports both ASCII and UTF-16 strings, and these are just the A and W variants. Following it up the stack, we get to this misery, which boils down to an infinite loop here. There's a check here, but just patching that out causes the game to crash. I think it's something to do with all this miserable global state that the game presumably sets up when it starts. Okay, let's take a step back. How would I check if a CD was present? Well I'd probably call get drive type A, so we set a breakpoint on that and see if that is called. But if we look at the call site in Ghidra, we get this hot mess. So the code calling this is obfuscated at rest and the game must deobfuscate it when it runs. Let's just dump the running process. Even though the game isn't playing, we can hope that the code in memory is now deobfuscated. And opening that in Ghidra, we can now see the code that calls get drive type A. It looks like the game resolves functions and calls them from global variables, which just makes it harder to track down function calls. There's also a check if a drive is a CD-ROM here. Browsing around, it calls some mysterious function in synth.dll. Maybe some DRM library? Here, it looks like it tries to read data from the disk. In fact, it's issuing raw ioctal commands, which returns some info about the CD in a buffer. So I did a bit of digging online, and it turns out that this game uses SecureROM, SecureROM, whatever, a somewhat infamous DRM from Sony. I also found this tool from Yartes, which will check for SecureROM, and we can see that it is using version 4.84.640016. I've actually had some correspondence with the author of this tool from previous videos, so a big thanks to them. So from reading around a bit, it seems that the game itself is actually encrypted, and the decryption key is stored on the CD. The details are a little light, but the gist of it is that the key is stored in such a way that most DVD burning and cloning software will actually fail to copy it. Regardless, the game will not run without the CD, so it's off to eBay I go. Okay, 
Okay, so I inherently trust the seller, so I'm going to whip out my Froybets and we're going to install this on my host machine. So I've installed it, but I still get the error if I remove the CD. I mean, it would have been nice if this just worked. Looking at this more closely, the game starts in the CMDT section, which is weird. Normally, Alinka will put the code and original entry point, or OEP, in the tech section. In fact, the actual OEP of the game is probably still in the tech section, but obfuscated, and then the deobfuscation code is in this command T section. So the game now is, can we find the original OEP, i.e. where the game actually starts from after all the deobfuscation chuff? I've gone back to looking at the call sites for Get Drive A, and this one here is interesting. It does a load of gubbins I hope I don't have to reverse, and at the end it calls Jump EAX. This is strange, because normal functions don't tend to just jump to a random address at the end. I'd expect a call instruction. A breakpoint on this, restart, and it jumps to this function. Now I can't be certain, but I think this is the original OEP. It does a lot of init stuff that you would expect a program to do when it first runs. And in fact, if we look at this address in the game before it runs, we can see it's obfuscated, or more likely encrypted, with the key on the CD. When the game is up and running, the decrypted code is just sitting there in memory, and now that we think we know what the OEP is, in theory we should just be able to dump the executable and just jump straight to that address. However, for some reason, the tool that I would normally use to dump exes, Scylla, isn't producing a valid binary. I've tried several tools and they all have the same issue. Maybe the game has done something to prevent dumping? A cursory compare between the original and dumped versions show that the main difference is in the tech section, i.e. where the obfuscated code lives. So I've done something marginally terrifying. I've copied the tech section out of the bad dumped executable and I've smashed that into the tech section of the original game. This in theory leaves me with a valid PE file with the deobfuscated code in it. Unsurprisingly, it still crashes. Stepping through, and it's crashing on underscore init term, which, according to the docs, internal methods that walk a table of function pointers and initialize them. And in the remarks section, these methods are only called internally during the initialization of a C++ program. Don't call these methods in a program. So this lends further credence to our hypothesis that this is the real OEP. In fact, it's the first function pointer that crashes, which if we trace it through is due to calling this function here. Uh... That's a lot of assembly, with a lot of bit shifting, and my favourite part, periodic time checks. This is a pretty classic anti-debugging technique. Basically, if the code takes too long to execute, it will assume that you're stepping through it with a debugger. And in fact, if we do step through it with a debugger, we get thrown into some infinite loop somewhere. The thought of reversing this all has given me a stomachache, but it must do something important if it's so well protected. In fact, this function is called from loads of places within the code. Over 3,000 of them. It's over 3,000! However, scrolling down the misery, we can see at the bottom another suspect jump EAX. But if we set a breakpoint on that, then it's an invalid address, so probably why it's crashing. There's another call to this strange function in the entry point, so I just used the debugger to force execution to this and then ran to the jump. This time, EAX is a valid address. It's underscore underscore p underscore 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 in env in msvcrt, which is part of the C++ runtime initialization. Obviously. I've spot checked another few cases, and they all resolve to real functions, so ignoring that first one, this seems to be a way of obfuscating function calls within the game. The function itself doesn't take any arguments, and in fact it can't really, because it has to preserve the original arguments of the function that it's obfuscating. It must be using the absolute address of the call site to resolve the final function. It's probably pulling the return address off the stack somewhere. It looks like it relies on some heap allocated data, presumably done during the decryption, which we no longer have in the game dump. So I think the game now is to resolve all of these functions and patch the binary to call the real function, effectively stripping out all of this DRM nonsense. And we know how to do it. We set the instruction pointer to the call site, we run it through to the jump, and then we just grab EAX. However, I'm not going to manually do this for the 3,000 odd call sites. We need a way of automating this. The thing is, we know how to do this in a debugger, so let's just write our own debugger. I did a live stream series where we built out a process hacking toolkit, and it's all open source. However, I only wrote it for 64-bit applications, and this old game is 32-bit. So a quick bodge later and it builds for 32-bit, and we can bring it into our project and use some of the primitives that we wrote. Now the crux of this is the following Win32 calls. Debug active process, which registers ourselves as a debugger with Windows for the game. Wait for debug event, which will block and wait for a debug event to happen. 
get set thread context, which allows us to get and set the registers of the game, and write process memory, which allows us to write a specific debug instruction into the process of the running game. So by combining all these, hopefully you can see how we can replicate the manual process that we were doing earlier. Scan for the call to the DL function, set EIP to that, set a breakpoint on jump EAX, run the program and wait for the breakpoint, grab EAX, rinse and repeat. However, things are not as easy as we would like. Just doing this resolves to a function that is only valid for that run of the program. If we patch it in and then rerun the game, the address is no longer valid. The calls this technique is hiding are all calls into libraries which are loaded at runtime and maybe at different addresses on each run. Windows normally handles this for you with something called the Import Address Table or IAT. In summary, it's an array of function pointers at a known offset that gets populated when a DLL is loaded. A program can then call these functions via the IAT thunk. However, Securum does all this resolution manually and returns the raw address of the function. But they should still all be in the IAT, so when we get EAX, we just need to go on a jolly through the IAT, find the function in there, and then resolve the call to that. Whew. After a bit of debugging, it sort of works, but after a while, it just returns invalid addresses. I wonder if there's some more timing shenanigans going on here. Heuristically, it seems okay with the first thousand resolutions before going wonky, so I've modified the program to kill the game after resolving that many, and then just restart it and continue from there, effectively working in batches. There's still a few it can't resolve, but if I run the game to the menu and then manually resolve it, it's then fine. So I'm guessing there's some other setup going on and you're not supposed to be resolving these till a bit later. This is an easy fix. When we launch the game, we just let it run through to the menu before resolving. Now I get to listen to the first few seconds of the theme song over and over again. Binary still crashes. It looks like the IAT isn't being correctly populated by Windows, so the functions that it eventually calls are incorrect. I've had a little poke around and it seems like there's a second IAT in the R data section. If we update the PE headers to say the IAT is here, then it gets filled in. Possibly a deliberate choice to try and make things a little bit more difficult. It's still crashing on a bunch of these calls that our program didn't resolve, but it didn't even find them. At the start of the program, they're just regular calls to the Diob function, but by the time we reach the menu, the game itself has mutated them. They now load the address from a heap allocated array, and inside that is just the address of the Diob function over and over again. So the DRM has taken some of these functions and added an extra layer of indirection to them, and because we now don't resolve the functions until the game is fully loaded, we miss them. If we just take every 4-byte address in this array and search for code that loads and calls an address from it, then we get 25 of these special buggers. Will it take us longer to code this up or resolve them manually? Well, we know the addresses of these, so we can just bodge our existing code a bit to handle this. Our debugger crashes when trying to resolve four of them, but we'll just ignore that for now. Still crashing, but it's on one of the calls we've definitely patched, so how has it unpatched itself? Oh, I see what's going on. It's actually loaded itself again into memory, but because I made a copy of the binary, the original unpatched one is still in the directory. So this goes away if we just rename our patched binary to be the same as the original XE. So now we're crashing at the four addresses we couldn't resolve with the debugger. Luckily, we can just manually fix those up. Okay, moment of truth. Yes! Okay, let's not get ahead of ourselves. This is still with the CD in it, so let's just try removing that. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah! Uh. You didn't say the magic word! Uh, Please! Uh, uh. God uh, damn it! Uh, uh. Hate this hacker uh, uh. crap! Okay, okay, let's not panic. I said don't panic. Let's just set a quick breakpoint on message box A. Okay, it's called from an if statement. Surely, after all this, it can't be as easy as just patching that out. So if you want to play this game, there's definitely some solutions out there. 
However, for me, the fun is in actually getting to the game and then showcasing the techniques that I used. I also try not to look at too much prior art when doing these videos. Again, for me, the fun is in the puzzle. However, during my research, I did stumble across two articles of people who had looked at Secure ROM in other games, and I'll link those two below because they are interesting reads and it was kind of nice to know that I was on the right track, even though our approaches did differ slightly. What a journey. And all this without making a single reference to... It's a unique system.